Hi, everybody. Good, thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we've got uh, a number of uh, pieces of legislation uh, that we continue to be very concerned about. Obviously, the COVID package, which is coming to the floor. Uh, we don't know either today or tomorrow. It's a real tragedy. Uh, when you look at that package, uh, we know that, that the result of that package is going to be middle class tax increases. We know for sure uh, that it includes uh, provisions that are not targeted, they're not temporary, they're not related to COVID, and it didn't have to be this way. Uh, we could have had a bill that was, um, you know, a fraction of the cost of this one that could have gotten bipartisan approval and support, but the speaker decided to go in another direction. And so we are going to be saddled with a burden, a uh, spending burden, and a tax burden uh, that is really uh, indefensible from the perspective of what it actually accomplishes. The other thing that we're focused on is uh, what's going on at the border. And uh, I, I watched this morning, I saw the White House Press Secretary, uh, Jen Psaki, say that she was heartbroken by what's happening at the border. And to that I would say policy has consequences. When you say that you're not going to enforce our immigration laws, when you say that you're not going to build a border wall, it has consequences. And we're seeing the tragic consequences of that right now at the border. Uh, so we are uh, going to be very focused as a conference on what's happening at the border, uh, on working to make sure that uh, as the Biden administration refuses to open schools, they have instead decided to open the border uh, and to let in uh, thousands of people potentially who uh, have got uh, COVID, you've got children at the border that have been separated again from their parents uh, and being heartbroken isn't a policy. So we expect to see action and the American people expect to see action. Uh, now with that, I'm gonna turn things over to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson, who's gonna talk about second amendment issues and some of the gun control bills that are on the floor this week. Thank you very much. I'm Richard Hudson, North Carolina's 8th Congressional District. Uh, I'm also the Conference Secretary. Uh, listen, I'm a father of a five-year-old who's in school. I care deeply about gun violence, and I'm proud that the Republicans in Congress are very serious about ending gun violence. Unfortunately, the Democrats in Congress are not serious about ending gun violence. And it's obvious by the bills they're bringing up for this week, which would do nothing to have stopped a single mass shooting in this country yet they threaten the rights of law-abiding citizens. The Republicans, when we were in the majority, passed meaningful legislation, including the Fix Next Act, which would have stopped the, school, the church shooting in Texas, like the 21st Century Cures Act, which had the most meaningful mental health reform in a generation and dealt with, with communicating with parents of children in crisis. We also passed the Stop School Violence Act, which put a billion dollars into hardening schools, into getting mental health resources to schools, and also into uh, training of law enforcement. Uh, I actually have legislation I've introduced uh, that will double the funding for the Stop School Violence Act. Uh, the Democrats have rushed two bills to the floor, no regular order, no uh, hearing time. They have allowed no meaningful input from Republicans. And, and these bills, again, would have not stopped a single mass shooting. Not Newtown, not Charleston, not Parkland, not Las Vegas, not Sutherland Springs, would not have stopped the shooting of our former colleague Gabrielle Giffords because her shooter passed a background check. H.R. 8 uh, fails to recognize the fact that every commercial gun sale in America requires a background check today. And H.R. 1446 creates delays for law-abiding citizens could be indefinite to acquire a weapon and would not have chose to close the Charleston loophole. If you want to close the Charleston loophole, I direct you to Tom Rice's bill, uh, H.R. 1518, which would, because the problem with the Charleston shooting was information sharing by law enforcement, and this bill allows that information sharing. Republicans have meaningful alternatives, and we have six bills that have been introduced uh, last week and this week. We will be pushing to end gun violence. Our legislation will actually address this problem. The Democrats are concerned about uh, taking away our Second Amendment rights, and the two bills this week will simply erode those rights. And so we're urging a no vote. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, 
another member, the gentlelady from North Carolina, who's the Republican leader of the uh, Education and uh, Workforce Committee, Ms. Fox. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the Democrats will have you believe that their uh, radical PRO Act protects the right to organize. All it does is protect the $1.6 billion that the labor unions uh, donate to support left-wing organizations. While trying to garner support for this outrageous bill, I've heard Democrats argue that it's the unions that built the middle class. No, the unions didn't build the middle class. Entrepreneurs and individual workers in this country built the middle class. And what this bill does is take away their freedom, making unions bigger and the individual freedom smaller. There are too many harmful uh, provisions to list in this bill, so I'll highlight some of the more egregious ones. It overturns 27 states' right to work laws. It eliminates uh, employees' rights to a secret ballot. It allows unions to boycott and picket ne nearly every business in America, whether they're subject to a union vote or not. Uh, the bill reinstates destructive Obama-era regulations, includes California's controversial AB5 with zero exemptions, which will deprive millions of Americans the opportunity to work independently and start their own businesses. This provision is particularly ill-advised since many Americans uh, during COVID, like working parents, are taking advantage of the flexibility the independent contracting model offers. At a time when employers and workers are forced to tighten their purse strings, it's unconscionable that Democrats are pushing a bill that would take millions from workers' paychecks and employers. It also forces uh, workers to hand over their private personal information to a union. AFL-CIO President Trumpka testified last Congress that unions will be able to go after workers, quote, in the grocery store and at their homes. This is not the way America operates. This personal information could very well be shared with third parties, subject, subjecting workers and their families to even more unwanted attention and harassment. The bill increases the risk of union corruption and wrongdoing. Federal investigators recently finished their investigation in the UAW where senior union leaders embezzled workers hard-earned union dues for personal expenses. Don't forget, federal law already protects un employees' right to organize and Republicans respect this right. Any reforms to the U.S. labor laws should help workers, not union bosses. Now's not the time to reward union bosses and liberal activists with political favors. Our focus should be on reopening schools and rebuilding the economy so all Americans have the opportunity to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, and now we have one of our new members uh, from Iowa, Ashley Henson, uh, who's going to talk about legislation she has to restore our schools, get schools back open again. Uh, good uh, morning, everybody. Um, yeah, Ashley Hanson from Iowa's First District, and I, um, I come to you today as a working mom of two school-aged kids. We need to get our schools back open. Uh, when I look at the last year, um, it's been quite the year, and the, the toll we've faced, especially when it comes to our young people, is staggering. Um, the mental health visits for our, our young people, as young as five, are increasing at a dramatic pace. They're ending up in our emergency rooms. Um, you know, when I look at why kids need to be in school, it's more than reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's, it's for the, the social interaction. It's for uh, the, the stable environment that they can be in. They need to maybe get out of a violent situation. They might be looking for that next meal. The kids need to be back in school. Um, we're now hearing as well that there are additional challenges where we're finding students have fallen off the grid. Um, we don't know where these students are. They've gone missing. Um, simply stop logging on for virtual school. Um, that's unacceptable. Teachers don't know where they are, and uh, the fact that they've fallen off the grid is, is uh, entirely important as a, as a working mom. Um, school enrollment is also dropping. Now that we're one year into this pandemic, um, it's quickly turning into two for many school districts around the country. And I think it's just, um, it's really sad that we're letting our kids fall through the cracks here, which is why we need to make sure that we are getting our schools back reopened. It's exactly why I introduced the Reopen Schools Act 
uh, which basically would set some parameters around the $54 billion in money that's already been appropriated by Congress before I even got here to make sure that schools have a plan to get reopened. They submit that plan to a governor, and then they actually follow through and reopen their schools. Um, the Democrats, I want to point out, blocked this for the fourth time last night. So four times they've chosen to make our kids political. Um, the Biden administration has no meaningful strategy to move forward. Um, getting kids into school, I'm sorry, I took this down. That's better, sorry. Uh, one day a week at this point is just unacceptable and our kids should not be a political football. And to keep moving the goalposts here, the kids are the ones that are losing this game. So um, when I look at examples of how we can lead on this issue, look to the state of Iowa. We have prioritized our kids and our teachers and getting back to school safely in the state of Iowa. It can be done. Iowa's a great model for that. Um, so I would encourage the Biden administration to look to the state of Iowa and how we've made sure that we can get kids back in the classroom safely. Um, Republicans are going to continue to lead on this issue. So what I would invite is uh, all my Democrat colleagues to join us. Let's make sure we have a plan to get those schools reopened and get kids back in the classroom. Thank you very much. And now uh, we're going to hear from our wit, Mr. Scalise. Thank you. Good morning. Good to see all of you. If you look at the House schedule this week, it's yet one more example of Speaker Pelosi pushing a socialist agenda that's focused on taking away the rights of hardworking families while also bankrupting the next generation with mountains of debt uh, that are focused not on COVID relief. If you look over 90 percent of the bill that they're going to bring back on the spending, a $1.9 trillion spending bill, uh, is not focused on COVID relief. It's focused on pushing more of the far left agenda. Uh, it's very concerning when you look at both what happened in the House and in the Senate, uh, Speaker Pelosi and Chuck Schumer shut Republicans out of the process completely. In fact, President Biden was offered the ability to work with Republicans, and he chose to have a go-it-alone strategy as well. And, and that lets Americans down all across this country who wanted to see a package that was focused on helping families, on helping small businesses stay afloat, and on helping reopen schools. Uh, we brought amendments, for example, to double the number of vaccines so that we could get more Americans vaccinated uh, quickly, and that was rejected on a party-line vote. Uh, there was an amendment in the Senate to say that felons in prison shouldn't be able to get taxpayer checks, and that was voted down on a party-line vote. Uh, so clearly, when you look at the priorities of Speaker Pelosi, it's to spend as much money as quickly as possible on her socialist agenda and to turn her backs on those of us who want to work together to confront this virus and to safely reopen our economy and our schools. You could just look at the crisis on the border. It's a major, major national scandal. Uh, Jay Johnson, the Obama Homeland Security Secretary, once said that if there were a thousand or more illegal crossings, that was a bad day. Today we're seeing three or four thousand illegal crossings a day at our southern border. It is a national crisis. And it needs to be confronted by President Biden, and he refuses to acknowledge it. Uh, there are super spreader caravans coming across our southern border. I think it's an interesting misplaced priority uh, that the Biden administration's agenda is to open America's borders and close America's schools. This is the wrong approach. This is not focusing on the hardworking families of this country. Uh, the science says that the schools should be open now. Every school should be open teaching kids in the classroom, and every day they refuse to do that, it's setting those kids back even further. Millions of American kids are being denied the ability uh, to, to learn and to be able uh, to compete. Uh, and the science is clear that the schools should be reopened. Again, we put more money. Ashley Hinson's bill uh, was offered up during the process of moving this bill forward to say, if schools get more money, it has to be to reopen so that kids could be learning in the classroom. And it was rejected by every Democrat, which begs the question, what do they need this money for if it's not to reopen schools during this pandemic? Uh, and so again, we're going to continue to fight for those hardworking families. We're going to continue to fight to reopen schools safely, to follow the science, not the union bosses. When you, say a union, when you see a union boss fighting to keep the public schools closed while taking the parents' money, uh, but sending their own kids to private schools, it just shows you uh, they're not even following the science. There's a tremendous amount of hypocrisy and double standard involved in the people that want to take a hard-earned money of these taxpayers across the country while not fighting for them, for their families, for their, their children. So we're going to continue to do that. Uh, we're going to continue to try uh, to 
fight for an agenda that works for families, uh, not to push this socialist agenda that Nancy Pelosi is bringing to the floor. Finally, I want to mention uh, this scandal involving Governor Cuomo. It's a scandal on multiple fronts. It's not just the sexual harassment scandal, which is very concerning, but it's also the scandal of what he did to seniors in nursing homes, starting with his order that went against federal CMS guidelines, forcing seniors who were COVID positive to go back into nursing homes and prohibiting those nursing homes from testing for COVID led to thousands of deaths that should have never happened. The Select Subcommittee on Coronavirus Republicans back in June started asking Governor Cuomo for the data. He refused back then, called us names, seems to have a pattern of bullying, but he never gave those families an answer. We are continuing to fight for those families who deserve an answer. It's recently come out that not only did he potentially obstruct justice in hiding the data, but he may have actually directed his own employees to manipulate the data, to lie about the number of deaths that could have been used to help prevent more deaths. And so I would call on President Biden to rescind his designation of Governor Cuomo as the gold standard for COVID leadership. That's not the gold standard. That is an epic failure that led to the deaths of thousands of people, and Governor Cuomo needs to come clean with the American people, with the people of New York, uh, parents, uh, children who lost their grandparents and their parents, who demand answers, who deserve answers to that data. And we're going to continue fighting for those families. With that, why don't we open up? Um, I have a question for you on these suspension votes last night. Democrats pulled 13 votes from the floor because a number of Republicans were threatening to force roll call votes, and they yeah, look, there, there's concern about what's happening on the floor, but just look at this week. Uh, Ten of the 11 bills being brought to the floor this week did not even go through committee. Uh, and you see this pattern by Speaker Pelosi, you know, who famously said years ago, you got to pass the bill to find out what's in it. Uh, when she rewrote Obamacare, in her office after it came out of committee. Now she's not even bothering to go through committee uh, with major pieces of legislation. Bills that should have gone to Virginia Fox's committee, for example, where they bypass the committee process so that she herself can write the bill behind closed doors with no public scrutiny, with no public hearings. I think a lot of Americans are very concerned about that kind of closed process uh, where nobody gets to see the bill until she drops it on the floor, never even went through a public process in committees. Uh, Republicans and Democrats alike, although we work hard to get on committees of jurisdiction so that they can then go and bring their expertise to make a bill better, and Speaker Pelosi shutting her own members out of that process. Frankly, every Democrat ought to be asked, uh, are they upset that they were not allowed to offer an amendment on a $1.9 trillion spending bill? that Speaker Pelosi wrote in her office and literally shut out every amendment. There was not one idea that could have been brought forward. Uh, and, and Democrats were told in the committees not even to bring a single amendment on a $1.9 trillion spending bill. So should bipartisan suspension bills then be held hostage? I don't, I don't want to see any hostages. I want to see an open process. I want to see Speaker Pelosi open up the House process to amendments by Republicans and Democrats. Uh, to bring in bills through committee again, something as basic as just having public hearings in committee on bills. And I think a lot of people are getting frustrated, including her own members, who don't like this closed Pelosi process. And to follow up to that, what is, who is leading this charge for suspension bills, and what is leadership advising this group that um, is trying to push for suspension and motions to adjourn, um, you know, when it comes to how to proceed with the yeah, those are individual members. That's not a leadership decision. Uh, but as a Republican leadership, we've called on Speaker Pelosi to open up the House process uh, to, to not, again, for example, getting rid of the motion to recommit, a process that's been around for decades that Speaker Pelosi shut down just to try to deny uh, the ability for people to bring amendments on the House floor. So we're going to continue to push for that. But is leadership's position to allow that, to allow this these procedures to happen? Or that's that's not a formal leadership position, but again, leadership has been very vocal on the Republican side that we want an open congressional process. We want bills to go through committee, uh, and we want uh, members' voices to be heard. House Democrats say they're bringing back the earmark process. Do you think this is something Republicans should participate in, and do you, um, are Republican leaders going to work on guidelines for, you know, changing the rules if so? We've heard the Democrats talking about bringing this back on their own. They haven't consulted with us. Clearly, we've had a lot of 
conversations. We had a meeting last night that was uh, widely attended uh, by the Republican conference, and our members have a lot of different views on this, but one thing I think that's universal is uh, we, we share a lot of concern about the abuses that happened in the past, and we don't want to see those abuses brought back. So uh, this is going to be a continuing conversation amongst House Republicans. Uh, it would have been helpful if Democrats would have talked to us about uh, what they're doing and, and if there's a better way to do it. So we're going to have that conversation, uh, and it's ongoing. One of the provisions in the Democrats' COVID bill is the creation of this monthly uh, ta a child tax rebate. $300 would go to those families. Do you consider that socialism? And, and is that something that you could see a conversation happen? You know, there's a lot of Democrats who want to make that permanent, and some Republicans who want to make that permanent. Do you think there's room for a conversation about doing that, or do you think that that is the definition of socialism? Well, I think the question is, what in the bill is COVID-related, and what is a broader policy that should be discussed separately? And I think a lot of people have a concern that Speaker Pelosi took advantage of the crisis to fill the bill with primarily things that have nothing to do with COVID right. that should have been discussed separately. And again, our focus from the very beginning was, let's help families who are struggling uh, with a targeted relief bill, not just sending everybody a check all across America, but to help the families who are struggling, as opposed to saying if somebody is maybe making more money than they were a year ago, they're gonna also get a check. The other thing is there are millions of small businesses that have already closed and it is devastating to see what some of these governors did to make it harder for small businesses to stay afloat while there were states like Florida and Texas who kept things open and had different results. It's a shame that in this bill they actually penalized the states who had more success keeping their, uh, keeping their economies going and, and helping the health care needs of their families uh, while rewarding states like California and New York who were the biggest winners uh, in this bill uh, just giving them billions of dollars. California's going to announce over a $10 billion surplus yet they're going to get more than $40 billion of money that's borrowed from our children in this bill. So what does any of that have to do with COVID? And I think that's the biggest frustration. This, I mean, this 90% of this bill has nothing to do with COVID. Whether it's a good idea or not needs to be debated independently. Don't take advantage of a crisis to try to ram through a socialist. Are you agenda. concerned that Republicans have a hard time rolling that back now that it's going to be in law probably tomorrow, later this week? Well, what we're focused on is helping families and helping businesses and getting schools reopened. We were willing to work with Democrats to double the number of vaccines, and they completely turned us away because they wanted to spend money on a whole lot of things that had nothing to do with COVID, and that's very unfortunate. Well, so we, we appreciate it. We will uh, we'll take one more. Yeah, we got okay. I'm wondering if you might be able to weigh in on President, or the former President's cease and desist letter and their kind of role you see in the campaign to see that the more like this. Yeah, and that was a new policy that he rolled out. Ultimately, uh, you know, President Trump's going to decide what kind of role he wants to play in elections in the future. I know we're focused on winning the House back. And if you look, the NRCC outraised the Democrats, uh, the DCCC, in January. Uh, and it shows you people recognize that Speaker Pelosi's socialist agenda is bad for America. And it's way out of touch with the mainstream of this country. And uh, we're going to keep working to get the House back and, and raise the money it takes to elect more good candidates like Ashley Hinson here, who's already a leader uh, helping fight to reopen schools. So we're going to continue fighting for hardworking families while they continue to promote a socialist agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. John, thank you. Go on to the studio. Michael, see you, buddy. See you. Thank you.